thank you very much. We have a really high profile panel. I'm really excited to tackle these questions. And I'd like to start with a quick introduction. Uh, I ask you to introduce yourself, starting with Mona. And there is one more thing. Uh, please tell us about your career, of course. But you know, I was forced to present a random fact about myself, so I'm asking you to do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so my name is Mona Elisa. I um, started my career off at Goldman Sachs in London on the trading floor. I was a market maker and prop trader there for eight years and then went to work for the buy side, uh, one of the largest European hedge funds. I ran a long, long short equity book for them for four years and then launched my own fund, um, small fund, $30 million AUM, which was a complete disaster. That's the first time in my life I realized what an operational mess the infrastructure of finance was and, uh, and also led me to... Um, become the founder of the Mellon Protocol, uh, one of the founders of the Mellon Protocol, and we are building uh, on-chain asset management. So, you know, we can dig deeper into that later. What's your random fact? Oh, my random <laughs> fact. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I guess my random fact is I learned about Wim Hof, uh, the Iceman, over Christmas, and I've now started doing his breathing and cold therapy every day. <laughs> right, that's good. Um, hi, everyone. Um, and first of all, thanks to Nicolo and the team for the invitation and, you know, already what is a really fantastic event. Uh, excited to be here. Um, so my name is Rene Reinsberg. I'm one of the founders um, of Cello. Um, Cello is an open platform for basically making um, all, the, all these kind of, you know, financial tools and, and services that Fabian just outlined accessible to everyone, everywhere on, on a smartphone. Um, and so we take this kind of mobile first approach. Um, we've done a lot of work around um, making you know, stuff work on even like a cheapest, the cheapest smartphones. Um, as we've heard yesterday, uh, financial inclusion is a big topic um, and crypto um, can definitely help. But currently most of the stuff, even when you saw the, the, the screen uh, demos, right? It's, it's running in a browser and um, we have 5 billion smartphones and that's kind of what we're focused on. Uh, fun fact, oh, actually, a little bit of career. Um, I started in traditional financial um, kind of uh, world, so I worked at Morgan Stanley in London for a while, um, and then also wanted to kind of see what's out there, and so um, lived abroad for a while, including in Venezuela, um, so about 10 years ago, worked with the World Bank there. Um, fun fact, um, I got really addicted to Arepas, uh, which is the local food there, and it's been really hard to find them, but... <laughs> Uh, whenever I'm in like a new place, I try to find like a Venezuelan restaurant and you know, kind of compare compare notes. Um, so if you um, if you have similar addiction, <laughs> no, it's a joke. Um, no. <laughs> Hello. Hi, um, Alain Felice. Um, I am uh, an entrepreneur since about 20 years, but traditionally um, in the or I studied obviously in the in the uh, the fintech uh, fintech industry, and in the last three years I've been moving into. Um, the new exciting world of, of blockchain. Um, my previous company is a company called YoYo Wallet in London, which is a, a mobile wallet, a loyalty wallet, um, with two and a half million users. Um, doesn't use blockchain at all. Um, very centralized uh, indeed. And now I'm actually uh, the CEO of a, a new technology, new company called Keybox, um, which is uh, using the blockchain and some very tried and tested um, algorithms and the encryption world to actually secure digital assets, secure uh, data in general, secure keys in a way that um, those keys, these assets are never um, whole, uh, ready to be hacked. They are fragmented and distributed across nodes. So it's a very new technology using the blockchain for, for cyber security. Uh, fun fact, uh, my God, this is, you didn't tell me about this fun fact business before. <laughs> yeah, that makes <laughs> me wonder. <laughs> um, I don't know if I have any fun fact about me. Um, listen, um, no, there's nothing, yeah, there's not, <laughs> that's not really, no, nothing, nothing funny about me, quite frankly. <laughs> so you can, you can ask me afterwards. I, I can't think of anything right now on top of my head. Ask me later. <laughs> I suppose you will find out at the party tonight. So. Yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. Hello, Vichal Garg. Uh, I started my career at Google. I worked on search ranking and ads ranking. Um, started a machine learning company about 15 years ago, sold it. Um, started a mobile infrastructure company, uh, sold that to Facebook, uh, where I ran a product group for a while. And uh, I'm now an investor. I run a venture capital firm called Electric Capital. We invest primarily in seed and Series A uh, crypto and blockchain companies. Um, and uh, I've been a pretty active angel investor in Frontier Tech um, for, for the last several years. Um, generally speaking, uh, what we have done is been early to spaces. Um, 
we were doing uh, SaaS 10 plus years ago. We were doing self-driving cars uh, several years ago, and of course crypto um, uh, for several years. And uh, I think our, our worldview, you know, I, I haven't worked in traditional finance or on Wall Street or anything, our, our worldview very much comes from our background as engineers, where we look at things through the lens of what does the technology allow you to do that you just couldn't do before. And many of the most interesting things in the world, we think, uh, tend to take technology and apply them in ways that are actually quite surprising and counterintuitive. Like if you told people uh, 20 years ago that the biggest businesses on the internet would be uh, staying at strangers' homes and getting into strangers' cars and they drive you where you want to go and they don't kill you uh, and you put your you know, entire life history into a database where anybody in the world can find you, they probably wouldn't have believed you. Uh, and so we actually look for those kinds of things that actually seem silly or stupid or counterintuitive and you would look at it and say, wow, nobody would ever want to do that. Why would anybody ever do that? And that actually gets us excited. And we think there are a lot of those kinds of interesting opportunities in this space. Fun fact? Fun fact. Uh, <laughs> I'm really blind if you take off my glasses. I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'd actually like to stay with you, Avicel, really sure. quick, quick, because we saw an introduction from a from an academia point of view. But uh, you, as an investor, as an entrepreneur, and you actually invest in one of the projects I'm using every day, DYDX. So yeah. I'm really excited. I'd like to hear what DeFi is for you. So what makes up DeFi? What is decentralized finance? Yeah, at a high level, I think DeFi, or I slightly prefer the, the term open finance because it doesn't necessarily need to be decentralized, though I think um, it's sort of an uh, you know, analogous, similar term, has, um, has three critical components. One is that it's open, which means uh, people can participate globally. Often the code is open source and you, can, and you can look at it. The second is that it's transparent, and often that comes with uh, being open source or, or the blockchain itself being auditable. Uh, and the third is that it's composable. Um, and as a side effect of of um, essentially now having software code instead of legal code, you can actually take these as Lego pieces and basically mm -hmm. combine them and build new and interesting things. And kind of to what I was just saying, I think that third bit is the really, really interesting thing here is um, moving from a world where instructions about, you know, if you, if you think about the world kind of abstractly, um, a lot of the world is here's a pile of money and then here's a bunch of legal documents around that money that dictate who has access to that money and under what condition those, that money can move. And on some future time horizon, you need to execute some instructions uh, around that money. And all of that is contained in legal code. And, and uh, it's only natural that that should become software code. Instead, literally, we use the word code, right? Uh, and uh, one of the benefits of, of it becoming software code is that it's composable. And so I can build on top of your code. Um, and that creates sort of this flywheel where the, the rate of innovation just steps up dramatically. And, the side effects of that are some of the things you're talking about. But I think specifically that third component is what really creates a lot of the sort of disruptive, counterintuitive things that we'll see in the space. Yeah, maybe just to add to this, um, you know, I think um, Avicio made the point earlier about sort of early internet and then, you know, we get Airbnb and Uber. And I think it's a little bit similar right now. A lot of the applications that we're seeing in sort of this open finance DeFi space are merely replicating what we already have in traditional finance, right? And what's, I think, exciting to a lot of the, the builders, entrepreneurs in the space is to think about, okay, what's, what's next, right? What are sort of the surprises? What are the things that actually um, bring kind of new value? Um, and there's a lot of value in open finance in terms of, you know, um, you know bringing more transparency and maybe reducing fees along the way. But, um, you know, areas that we're excited about at Celo are functional, uh, local currencies, um, seeing new monetary policy implemented um, at a very different scale, um, you know, in history you find all these um, interesting kind of experiments that have kind of run kind of locally, actually, in, you know, nearby here in Austria, the experiment of Virgil um, playing with Stemmerich um, during the Great Depression is a, is a really interesting uh, story um, if, you're, if you want to read up on it. Um, but these are things that, you know, until really this decade, um, weren't able from a technology perspective to really execute at a big scale. And so having something that's composable, that's open, um, I think, you know, together with seeing how many people are coming in the ecosystem, um, you know, makes it really exciting to look forward what's going to actually happen in the next 10 years and how financial products and services um, are going to change. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you a question anyways, but... Uh... Oh, I, I would just like to say, I, I, I think about it in two parts. So I partly disagree with you, in the fa or both of you maybe, in the sense that I don't think it's all about the new stuff in the sense that, you know, we couldn't have predicted Uber. Yes, there's some really interesting stuff in decentralized finance. For example, one of the things I find very exciting is flash loans. The idea that you can borrow money for one block time 
You can borrow crypto for one block time, put on an arbitrage and return your loan within 14 seconds is like amazing. You know, maybe it's not quite Uber, but this is new and novel. But I think, uh, I, think I would split it up in infrastructure. So financial infrastructure is not going to change. The things that make financial infrastructure work, the things that mean people do business with each other have been around for centuries. People need to know that if they invest in a fund, for example, that the manager is going to invest that money in a way that was pre-permissioned, not run away with it to <laughs> Bahamas and spend it on a villa. Uh, if, you, you know, if you invest in a fund, you want to make sure that he or she invests in that asset universe in, with you know, pre-permissioned you know, uh, reputable exchanges with whatever and so on and so forth. These are the kind of things that financial intermediaries traditionally paid a large role in enforcing. And I think what the, for me, what the really exciting thing about decentralized finance is that you can basically, uh, as Avishal said, write that, uh, write the, those rules in code and essentially collapse the entire value chain of asset management, basically making uh, intermediaries largely redundant in some cases. Now there is, you know, it, there is a there there is a you know <laughs> obviously a big debate around that, but I think that's what's very exciting. And then on a product layer, I expect that we'll see a lot of new and novel products which are native to Web three, which will be sort of like the Uber and the um, more innovative stuff that we've never heard of before. Well, I also like to hear your view. Do you agree with that, or do you have something else? I think I like the term decentralized actually more than just open finance. If you want to talk about semantic, because it's the it's the whole point. I mean, if it's going to be transformative uh, compared to the the stuff we use in in in, in financial services today. Um, whether it's for uh, money transfers or it's for lending and for saving, savings and so on, it has to be really completely novel. And and for me, the novelty is is, is a complete decentralization, with with the the Web three fundamentals embedded, right? The openness, the, the trustless, and the, the the permissionless. What gets me excited is the permissionless piece, right? That there there isn't really any outside entity, government or central bank or anything else that is going to be interfering with, 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 with the flows, the flows of, 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 of monies, with digital monies. Um, now, how quiet this is going to be actually evolving uh, you know, over time and, and, and how, how the governments are going to react to that, I don't know. This is subject to the huge, huge debates. Um, but um, the fundamentals are being built right now. We're starting to see even uh, the sort of the application layer you talked about. I mean, I've, I've been using Argent, for instance, and you, you just show, showed uh, Uniswap. I mean, it's a beautiful interface. Of course, you know, there's not very many users out there still, right? Yeah. It's, it's, we're talking about 40, 50,000 users, active users, or all these DeFi things, and it's not exactly huge, right? If, if I, you know, if I create a a mobile wallet, and I show my investors that I've got 40, 50,000 users after one year, they think, well, this is actually not going anywhere. But here, this is a combined, right? So it's, it's all very novel, um, but it has all the fundamentals to work. Mm. You know, somebody can actually put a spanner in the works. Uh, that could be the government, but it has the fundamentals to work. It's actually a perfect segue to a question I'd like to ask one. Do you think people, the end consumers, actually care about the decentralized aspect? Um, it's a good, yeah, there's two answers, kind of. Uh, one, I mean, they generally don't care about what the technology is that's sort of underlying everything, right? I mean, no one's going to really try to understand the details of how the iPhone actually works that they're using every day. So um, similarly here, I think there's maybe in the space too much of a debate about sort of the technical nuances and, you know, um, some of the, you know, conversations around hey, how scalable is... Uh, one blockchain versus another. I think those have maybe been um, kind of away from the the real debate, which is how do you make this really usable for for people, and how do you kind of actually make them understand. Um, I think there is a point around the risk that kind of you brought up, right? And so, um, you know, even with with stable coins, how do you kind of explain to someone um, that holds tether or, or die? Um, what happens when you know something like something unexpected happens, right? Um, and that's you know there you kind of you have to kind of layer in some of those more complex topics on decentralization, right? So I think this is kind of something collectively as a space that we that we're going through right now, which is like how do you uh, translate this to an end user who you doesn't have a you know degree in cryptography, um, but but actually kind of bring the value. And, and I think this is where 
Um, to Vichel's point, maybe you know it's sort of the openness, and I think maybe like that's where I disagree with, with you maybe a little bit uh, too. Is there is um, I think a certain pragmatism is right. Um, not everything. I don't think everything across the stack has to be decentralized. I'm not like a decentralization purist, but I think certain elements and certain use cases. Um, you know, decentralization can provide a lot of value, right? If you think about someone in Venezuela, we talked, you know, talked about that earlier. Um, you know, having the government sees, um, you know, assets, um, U.S. dollar accounts, right? Um, in Argentina, some similar things are happening. Um, suddenly, decentralization and sort of, you know, sort of this, you have your own kind of custody over over your assets becomes something that's very important. In other places, that's less that's less important, right? And so, as you as you think about um, decentralization, I think it's important to match it to the use case. Now, from an end user perspective, uh, we've done you know user research pilots. Um, mostly focused on developing emerging markets, so from you know Argentina, Colombia, um, Mexico, Brazil, um, to Africa, East and West Africa, to Southeast Asia, and I think a lot of it um, there are definitely differences in terms of how people are using mobile money and financial services. But one thing is always the same, and that's kind of this uh, this notion of trust, um, like you know how do you gain the trust of the end user to use a certain product or service? And a lot of it comes down to people, right? Um, there's an M-Pesa agent in Kenya who um, an end consumer will build a relationship with and know that when they want to cash in or cash out, that person is there for them and, and can help them. Um, and so for us, I think as kind of technologists, the, the question is how do we translate that into um, into sort of product, right? And having like easy communication, um, sort of in, in plain words, explain what is happening under the hood without maybe using a lot of the jargon that we, we use. Kind of. Can, can I yeah. just, just chip in quickly? The, uh, the yeah, decentralization, I don't think people care uh, yeah. about this. That, uh, that was your question. Personally, I don't think they care, but, it, but, but they, they do care about uh, the speed or lower cost and so on. And I think it's a, it's a byproduct of decentralization. Um, but if you're going to be using, if you've been using Coinbase uh, as your as your as your exchange and, and your custodian, and you're happy with it, and, and and you haven't been hacked or your 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 keys haven't been hacked, then you're probably going to continue to use Coinbase. Um, a decentralized exchange, for example, will make sense to you once you realize that actually Coinbase is probably not that that secure. But you're going to realize that when you you you, you lose you lose some 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 digital assets. Yeah, and I would also just add, like I think it depends where you come from you know in switzerland you know if you have a bank account with a million francs in it you're probably going to have an, an, a, an a house you're going to own that house in the bank account still in 10 years there are other uh, countries in the world where you see misappropriation of assets or devaluation of currencies and for that you know decentralization may be much more important to the end user than it is maybe in um in the more sort of uh, stable stable jurisdiction means, yeah. yeah and also in terms of accessibility i guess yeah yeah so I'd like to go into specific applications, and it's actually a question for you, Mona, and you, and Michelle. Um, I'd like to start with asset management. I mean, you have been in this space for a long time with Melon, and I'm sure you can tell us some nice stories about how this might disrupt asset management, right? Yeah, I mean, um, when, so I mean, from my own personal story, when I launched my uh, $30 million fund, I thought it was a dream come true, and then I started managing the fund, and I had probably the worst year of my life, um, realizing what it was to book a trade, the settling T plus three, being on the phone to fund administrators all the time, custodians. Uh, I was absolutely shocked that in the 21st century we still operate and manage funds in this way. And, uh, and in, in the end, I said, actually, I don't feel this is right for my investors. I should be focusing on investing, not in, not on operations and admin. Um, I then kind of looked into it a bit deeper. It turns out that there is a research report by Citi which says that funds cannot survive beyond, I think, one year without, with less than $200 million in AUM. That is an incredibly high barrier to entry. And actually what it means is that when allocators come to invest in funds, they immediately dismiss any fund below that size because it's, um, because it's uh, too, too high risk to fail. Right, so um, so so this is this was a very interesting uh, you know discovery, learning about smart contracts and tokenization. This was early uh, 2000, uh, 2015. I sort of started to think, well, hang, hang on a second. This this is uh, smart contracts give us this new oppor opportunity to reinvent the infrastructure for asset management based on an assumption that everything becomes tokenized. You can basically completely automate 
uh, that entire um, you know operational administrative the calculation of navs calculation of fees the uh, you know you don't have that settlement risk anymore uh, or booking risk because it's as you saw with Uniswap immediate settlement immediate trade uh, very you know different kind of risks but uh, not not the kind of um, pain points that we used to find before and I was Im immediately captured by that. So building this uh, infrastructure has been a really large challenge. You know, we're working with the technology which is also not mature yet um, and that's a big challenge. Uh, you know, we started off, we were the, one of the very first wave of ICOs uh, in early 2017 and we, um, you know, we, I had to hire a team that knew how to teach themselves stuff because there was no documentation around Ethereum at that stage, you know, or good documentation. And this, is, this has been uh, really good in shaping the way our team thinks. You know, we are problem solvers. We, uh, you know, have to figure out solutions and creative solutions for things. Smart contracts are not perfect. As you saw, we are aware of the risks. We invested very early in a team in Singapore, which we're doing formal verification, which is like the ultimate holy grail of security on smart contracts. We contacted them for help. They were the only team doing formal verification in 2017. And they said, sorry, we actually are just about to wind down the project because we couldn't find enough funding. And I was like, what? And they were like, yes. I said, how much funding do you need? They said, we're five PhD students at the, the NUS in, in Singapore. Uh, we just need $50,000. <laughs> and I was like, done. I was like, and now, you know, some of them now work on our team. By the way, one of them was Loy Lu, who's the founder of Kyber Network now. Nice. So, um, so, you know, things like that, you know, we've been investing in the security space very early. We're very involved in the smart contract insurance, but it's like problem solving every day. We're still not at a mature place, but we're very excited about things to come. So, Vichelay, I suppose there are many people coming to you from startups with their ideas, right? And uh, many of them might also be in the DeFi space. Now, the first part of the question is what excites you about DeFi world as some use cases? And the second one is, you know, at the end of the day, as an investor, you need to make money. And uh, when it's entirely decentralized, when it's completely open, when you have no restrictions whatsoever, no privileges, how do you make money with that? Yeah, so on the first question, I think... Um couple of thoughts. I mean, without getting into the specifics too much, I think there are a couple of frameworks that are useful. So one is generally technologists tend to be too early rather than too late. Um, you know, you look at like Reid Hoffman and he was playing around with social networks in 1995. Uh, and he actually owns the patent for, you know, there's a six degrees patent, which is the patent on social networking that Reid Hoffman and Mark Pincus, who started Zynga, actually own. Uh, but they were just like 10 years too early. And, and then they sort of kept playing in that space for a long time before um, MySpace and Facebook eventually happened. Uh, and so the first thing that we usually tell entrepreneurs and, and founders when we're looking at the space is you're probably too early. You, you've seen the future, you understand what's possible, uh, but you need to be able to articulate why now is the time that actually this, this needs to happen. So many of these things, you know, we, we very well may be in the um, even pre-MySpace era of social networking in some sense, right? It's just way, way too early. So that's one framework. Second framework is... Um, you know, you tend to see, we always, I think for, for so many people that, that work in, in frontier tech, that are entrepreneurs, that, you know, people at this conference, I think, that are thinking about the future, um, we can see that the biggest impact is going to be on the developing world in places where this infrastructure does not yet exist. Um, I tend to think that that is not where technology gets adopted. I think technology gets adopted top down. So look at something like Tesla. It's a $250,000 Roadster, and you work your way back to a Model 3. Um, you start with the iPhone, you work your way back to Android. Uh, the internet adopted that way. So um, generally speaking, we have a slight bias towards who are the richest people in the world that need this. Uh, so it's actually not a surprise to us that store value, digital gold, Bitcoin, um, starting essentially with billionaires uh, and high net worth individuals is actually a killer use case. And then it's going to work its way back. Um, and so we have a slight bias towards use cases that are starting from people who already have significant wealth and need to think about tools that, you know, in the existing system, it, it turns out, um, generally, people who have a lot of wealth are underserved by the existing financial system as well. Um, and, uh, and a lot of this tooling might actually be a really great fit for people kind of on that end of the spectrum, and we tend to have a bias towards that. To your second question around how to, how to capture value, um, sort of an odd thing maybe for a VC in this space to say is, uh, I don't think most of these things will actually capture any value. Um, it's amazing infrastructure that needs to exist. Uh, and it will allow the next generation of companies to capture value, but most of them will not actually capture value. There are basically three models that we've seen that will capture some value. One is if you build a base layer protocol where the token itself can capture value. That might be effectively a commodity sort of um, network where essentially the price of the token collapses to you know, the electricity and computational power to power the network. Uh, or you might get some sort of store value, you know, monetary premium, something like a Bitcoin. Um, the second is actually tried and true open source, uh, you know, 
you build a technology, you put it out there, and then you're the world experts at it, and so you charge enterprises to come use the technology and run a version of it, or um, you know, uh, your consulting services on top of that. So it's essentially the services model on top of that. Companies like Red Hat have shown you can actually scale that kind of a business. Um, and then the third is uh, vertically integrated. So um, kind of to, I think, what Renee was saying, um, a lot of times users don't care about the infrastructure. They just want to know that they can get a loan for 1% cheaper. They don't care how it works. Um, and so I think if you look at something like Libra, you know, probably if they're ever able to launch, um, you know, the end user is not going to really care. They're, they don't really care what the infrastructure looks like. All they know is all of a sudden they can send money to some other WhatsApp user around the world and it shows up. Um, and so I think these kinds of vertically integrated businesses where the end user doesn't realize it's crypto, but now you can do a thing and it's more efficient, um, are actually underinvested in relative to a lot of sort of more decentralized. Um, but on the back end, they're sort of more open and they, they look different than traditional companies. And so they don't really, they're not really a fit for traditional VCs, which is where we slot in. Maybe just to make this <clears throat> a bit more fun. Um, Do you disagree with me now? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I kind of agree on the first point, and then this is what we've been seeing, you know, generally with Bitcoin and, and some of the DeFi kind of users who are sort of, you know, early adopters that are, you know, playing with this for fun. But then you look at things like local Bitcoins, which is sort of a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace where people in, in sort of the physical world um, even sometimes uh, can, you know, kind of, basically on an off-ramp um, in, into crypto. Um, and you look at kind of last year, you look at, um, you know, with what happened in Hong Kong, um, you know, Argentina had an election, inflation has been on the rise. You look at Venezuela and you can really see local Bitcoin uh, volumes, um, you know, spike. Um, and so, you know, some of the early adopters, maybe um, people that are sort of underserved on sort of the, the sort of high end of the kind of uh, wealth spectrum, but, but also I think at the opposite end, this is where uh, people are desperate for, you know, basically a, store of, a basic store of value, um, uh, a way to participate in the financial system. And, you know, I think there was a lot of talk about like how many people don't have bank accounts, um, but, you know, a lot of this is driven... Um, you know, not necessarily, um, or it's, it's, it's driven by not actually having a legal identity or having, um, you know, when you kind of then take this to DeFi, um, beyond sort of the bank account participating in, in sort of basic financial products and services, having something like a credit score, right? And so this is where um, I think beyond sort of the, um, a lot of the financial applications, the work that's happening um, in blockchain and crypto really uh, around um, self-sovereign identity can, can really be um, a big enabler because suddenly we're, we can take different, um, different kind of data points about your identity to actually kind of build that credit score. And it's something that's happening in the centralized world. If you go to Southeast Asia, there's a lot of lending companies that will basically pull people's uh, Facebook um, graph um, to make decisions on, on kind of lending and lending rates. Um, but doing that actually in a way where the, where the end user stays in control and then tying that into these, um, these applications natively, I think that's something that's, that's really powerful and promising. And I think that's really going to enable, together with that e easier user experience, um, a lot of sort of the, you know, um, underserved um, on sort of the um, kind of lower income part of the, of the spectrum to kind of come into this industry. Um, and I think it's nice that we're starting to experiment with people that, quite frankly, if, you know, they, they lose money in these experiments, um, it's fine because, you know, I think we have to keep in mind um, when we talk about financial inclusion that we talk about vulnerable populations and so really figuring out, hey, how do you, um, you know, make sure that someone understands how to kind of engage with these products, um, what happens if they, you know, forget their seed phrase, um, you know, what are sort of the remedies. Um, I think that's really, that's really critical. And maybe just to tie into um, the whole too early argument, I think it's also really, um, you know, if we're waiting for traditional finance to, to, to hop onto, you know, equities and bonds to hop onto the blockchain, that's probably going to, we're probably too early for that. I would totally agree with that. However, from our see, what we're seeing is like this totally new, interesting, investable products, which are totally new and novel, which are interesting as new asset classes. So crypto collectibles, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, things like crypto kitties, which are trading for hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in some of the cases where they're so super rare. Land on Decentraland, there's marketplaces, people want... These are virtual reality assets which are registered on a blockchain. Uh, axes or Axie, you know, Axie Infinities. These are new asset classes. Writing insurance for smart contract risk. So if you're an auditor and you're like, you think you're pretty good, you could start writing insurance 
for protocols and like earning money on that. So these are like really interesting new product areas which are not native to the Web3 world and don't need, we don't need to wait for um, traditional finance to move along because they're there today and they're, you know, there are opportunities today for the grabs, up for grabs. All right. Well, thank you very much to our amazing panelists. Uh, of course, you also get some Swiss chocolate. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much thank you. for being here and uh, have a nice conference.